Hello, I'm Thesis Sweeney and I'm here to talk about this Traller number of a parity game. This is a joint work with Lord Davia and Martin Yotensky. Before I start talking about this Traller number of a parity game, we need to know what a parity game is. And before I do that, I will talk about graphs rather than a game. And here I will talk about even and odd graphs. What, what am I referring to? Here, the graphs we will consider are directed graphs along with a labeling for each of them from natural numbers. This labeling we we'll call priorities throughout this presentation. And what is an even graph? An even graph is a graph which in which every cycle is even. And what is an even cycle? An even cycle is one where the highest priority of all the vertices occurring in the cycle is even. So let me first show you an example of an even cycle. Consider this simple cycle with just two vertices. The priorities occurring in this cycle are 2 and 0. Now we know that the highest among 2 and 0 is 2 and 2 is even and therefore we call this an even cycle. So an even graph again is a graph where every cycle is even. Given an even graph, we will define something called its attractor decomposition that will serve as a witness to its evenness. But before we do that, let me just define what an attractor of a set is. So given a set, we say that the attractor of the set is just the set of all vertices from which all paths eventually lead to a vertex in this set. Now that we know this, let's look at a even graph and in this graph let d be a an even value that is at least as large as any of the priorities. And suppose it happens that if you look at the set of all vertices of priority d and look at its attractor, it happens to be all of the graph, then we know that this graph is even because all cycles will contain this highest even priority d in them. But this need not be the case and it might be that the attractor a of this set of vertices d is just a strict subset. If it happens, then we look at the rest of the graph and in that we identify S1, a set of vertices where the high, uh, highest priority in this is at most D minus 2. And moreover, it has no edges to this part of the graph. That is, if at all it has any outgoing edges, then it is to A and not to anywhere here. Once we identify such an S1, one, we look at A1, which is just the attractor of S1, and look at the re remaining part of the graph. And in this, we iteratively identify S2, S3, so on till SL. Since each of these SIs contain only vertices of priority at most D minus 2, then they must also recursively have a decomposition for each of them. And with this, we define the attractor decomposition of an even graph to be this. So if we are given a decomposition and a cycle, and if the cycle contains priorities that are all smaller than d minus 2, then it lies entirely in one of these SIs, and therefore we know that they are even by the recursive argument. If not, they must pass through A, and if they do, they means they also contain a vertex of priority D, which makes that cycle even. Every decomposition of an even graph has a hierarchical structure that can be naturally described by an ordered tree. The tree of decomposition is defined as follows. If recursively you are given the trees for S1 to SL as these below, then we just say that the tree of this decomposition is the just a new you take these trees and then you introduce a new parent and you define these trees to be its children in that order now let us look at an example for the decomposition of this even graph for d being 4 uh, but we know that there are no vertices of priority 4 so the attractor of that set would just be empty and in this part of the graph which is the whole graph we will identify a set S1 such that there are no outgoing edges and clearly this is such a set S1. 
Now A1 is the attractor of this set S1 which consists of all of these vertices and S2 would just be this graph, this part of the graph. Now we recursively find decompositions for these two S1 and S2 and if you want to observe a tree of this decomposition it would just be this tree because uh, we get these two small trees from uh, the, this S1 and S2 and we put them together using this one node. Now that we know what an even graph is, we are equipped to talk about parity games. A parity game is again a directed graph labelled with integer priorities. Moreover, the vertices belong to two different players, Steven and Audrey. The objective of Steven is to select the subset of outgoing edges out of his vertices such that if you restrict the graph to the edges that he has proposed along with all of Audrey's outgoing edges, then the resulting graph must be an e even graph and the objective for Audrey is the dual. Now we'll formalize the, this by defining it properly. So a strategy for Steven is a subset of vertices proposed by Steven. Here there is a strategy highlighted in red for this graph, uh, for this game. A dominion for Steven is the subset of vertices such that he has a strategy where the graph obtained by using only the strategy edges along with all of Audrey's edges results in an even graph. We call such a graph, when you restrict it to these edges, a strategy graph. Here in this example, the orange set is a dominion for Steven because when using the red strategy, the resulting graph is even and this is the strategy graph as I mentioned. Given a dominion, we know that there is a strategy for Steven such that the strategy graph is even and we already know that an even graph has a decomposition. So we can just define a decomposition of a dominion directly as the decomposition of the resultant strategy graph for even. Now if you want, we can extend this definition for tree of an attractor decomposition of a dominion as tree of the attractor decomposition of the strategy graph as well. Now let's look at an example here. This is a dominion for Steven. and. If Steven decides to go with the red strategy here with these edges, then the decomposition for this graph is shown here and the tree of the decomposition is just this tree with two children. The takeaway here is that every dominion has the shape of a tree and parity games and trees are somehow inherently intertwined. I will argue soon why. Solving parity games is known to be in the complexity class NP intersection co NP, but there are still no known polynomial time algorithms for it. In fact, until 2017, the only had exponential time algorithms. However, there is a breakthrough result in 2017 by Kalu, Jane, Kosinia, Lee, and Stefan, which produced a quasi polynomial time algorithm. After this, several quasi polynomial time algorithms are also published. But even though they looked very different at first glance, they fit in the following pattern. And that has something to do with the trees. So uh, the, these quasi-polynomial al time algorithms take a parity game as a an input and they somehow use something called a universal tree, which I'll define shortly, and produce a solution in time which is polynomial with respect to this universal tree and this parity game. But what are universal trees? For that we need to know what it means to embed a tree into another. So a tree T embeds into another if it can be obtained by pruning this other tree to obtain this tree. So for instance this tree here can be obtained by pruning this tree by deleting these red vertices over here and an NH universal tree is just a tree large enough such that any ordered tree with height at most H and at most n many leaves can be embedded into this tree and here we have an example of a 4-2 universal tree 
So any tree with four vertices and height at most two can be embedded inside this. Now let us go back to this picture and now I can argue that nearly all quasi-polynomial time algorithms fit this pattern. That they take a parity game, they somehow have a universal tree and then produce a solution. First, we will start off with the succinct progress measure algorithm by Jordensky and Lasse. But this was the second quasi-polynomial time algorithm that came through and it produced a progress measure as a witness to the solution for parity game. Just like how attractor decomposition is a witness that this parity game is winning for Steven, so it's progress measure, but this is a very local witness. This algorithm provided a universal tree explicitly in, this al in it. Here, we see three algorithms which produce an attractor decomposition as a witness to the solution of the parity game. The first is by Paris and it's followed by Letin and Cheve and Wojciak. And in a recent yet unpublished work of Jordansky and Morvan, they show this, this breakthrough result by Paris and the follow-up by Letin and all fit into this pattern of taking a parity game and then using a universal tree and running an algorithm on it. And finally, we come to this breakthrough result of Kalud et al. And we will now argue that there is a universal tree embedded into it. Uh, at first glance, this is not very obvious. However, in a recent SODA paper by Shevinsky, Devi Otfialko, Yurvinsky, Lazic in Paris, they argued that any parity game solver which pr uses a separating automata, I will not define this, uh, contains a universal tree in it and therefore we can claim that Kalud et al's work also have a universal tree in it. So do all quasi-polynomial time algorithms fit this pattern? Well, no. There is one more algorithm left and it is by Letin. It didn't have a universal tree embedded in it nor did it produce a separating automata which would embed a universal tree. So we wish to understand this a little bit more. So let me go into a bit more details to see what this algorithm does. It starts with a parity game with 10 vertices and D priorities. And it takes a number K and produces a larger parity game with at most N times D to the K many vertices and 2K many priorities. And this parity game is just called a K register game. And even if you use an exponential time algorithm to solve this large parity game, you can get a runtime of n times k and n, n to the k times d to the k square. Lettinen's main result was to show that Steven wins in the original parity game if and only if he can win the log n register game, as in the k register game where k is was log n. So if you observe, this gives a corollary of a quasi-polynomial time algorithm because just by substituting k to be log n, we get a quasi-polynomial time algorithm to solve parity games. But what if k is smaller? If we knew that g was equivalent to this gk with k significantly smaller than log n, then we could solve G even faster. And as Lettinen observed, if K was constant, then the runtime is, is in fact a polynomial. So here we have the set of all parity games that are winning for Steven that can be solved with K being at most log n. However, we see that if you supply K equals 1, 2, and 3, this set starts off small but grows in size and the smallest k for which Steven wins a parity game with k registers is called the register number of a parity game. So given a game, the register number seems like a fundamental parameter, like given how it captures the hardness of the problem in some sense. But 
the complexity of the definition given by Lettinen makes it difficult to intuitively understand what this parameter exactly means. And especially there is no graph theoretic characterization of such games. Our main result in the paper is to show that the register number is the same as the Strahler number. And we're only a small step for, away from understanding our main result. So for that, we need to talk about rivers. How are rivers made? Let me be more precise. So when two rivers, Kranga and Brahmaputra meet, who decides to name the resulting one Ganga and not Brahmaputra? It so happens that there is a system to do this. It was proposed by Horton and then later made rigorous by Strahler. And it captures the branching complexity of river networks. And how exactly does it do that? So the source of a river is given number one. If two rivers of the same Strahler number combine, it increases by one. If not, the maximum of the Strahler number is inherited. In this example, when the rivers of Strahler number 1 and 1 combine, then the resulting river has Strahler number 2. However, when the river of Strahler number 1 and 2 combine, then the resulting river still has Strahler number 2. More formally, when there are several children for a node in a tree, the Strahler number is the maximum of its children's Strahler number if the maximum is unique. If not, it is one larger than the maximum of its children's Strahler number. So given a decomposition, we know that there is some tree associated to it. So, and therefore we say that Strahler number of a decomposition is just the Strahler number of the tree associated to the decomposition. So in this example, we have this decomposition of the parity game. Uh, I mean, of this even graph here. And we see that the Strahler number of this event graph is the Strahler number of this tree, which is just 2. Uh, similarly, if you are given a dominion, you obtain a decomposition by fixing a strategy. However, this decomposition need not be unique, as demonstrated by this example. So look at the same parity game again. This is a dominion and a parity game. But here is one decomposition which has the following tree. And then here is an other decomposition for the same game, which has this tree. And we see that these two trees are different and have different Strahler numbers. So we say that the Strahler number of a dominion is the smallest Strahler number of all Stephen attracted decompositions of the dominion. So for this dominion, the Strahler number would be 1 because this is the smallest uh, decomposition in terms of Strahler number that we can obtain. Now we want to define the Strahler number of a parity game. So given a parity game, you can divide it into the Steven and Audrey dominion and get the corresponding trees for these decompositions with the smallest possible Strahler number for each of them. Then we declare the Strahler number of the whole game to just be the maximum of the Strahler number of both of them. So here we have the Strahler number to be 3 and 2. So the Strahler number of the whole parity game would just be 3 because that is a maximum here. We're now back to our result again. We were able to prove that the register number coincides with the Strahler number thereby giving a characterization of parity games which has a fixed register number. So uh, there was this result by Paris published in CSL 20 this year which improved the runtime of the register games algorithm by Lettinen but it was only for cases where k was log n. However, we had a corollary whose details I will not go into. Uh, which helped us extend these results of Paris to uh, all k and not just for k to be log n. Uh, more importantly, we are also now able to see Lettinen's algorithm as a part of this picture where we have a parity game and this time we take as input a Strahler University, which we will define very soon, to produce a solution. Uh, we do that by arguing that the most efficient implementation of Lettinen's register game technique takes the form of letting one of the two meta-algorithms, uh, the attractor decomposition algorithm or the progress measure lifting algorithm, search for a witness on a suitable universal tree. We already saw what an NH-universal tree is and a K-Strawler NH-universal tree 
just me is a weaker form of an nh universal tree and could potentially be smaller it's just the tree that is large enough to embed into it all trees which have uh, at most n many leaves and height h and stralar number no more than k uh, indeed we were able to prove that small stralar universal trees exist and what i mean when i say small is that it's of size polynomial in n and exponential in k however the base of the exponent is just h with the help of these small stralar universal trees that we discovered we were able to come up with a runtime for parity games uh, characterized by register number or equivalently the stralar number which runs in time polynomial in n and is exponential in k where the base of the exponent is d if k was in fact constant we again see that the runtime is polynomial n in fact both in kalud et al and the success in progress measure algorithm by yudinsky and lasik they had remarked that their algorithms ran in polynomial time if d was like log n on the other hand we also know that lettinen showed that k being constant provided polynomial results we were able to extend these claims uh, and show that if the product of k and log d over k was all at most log n then we again have um, a polynomial algorithm for parity games so let's quickly recall our main results uh, we were able to show that the register number uh, was actually equal to the stralar number and we have also unified all the quasi polynomial time algorithms for parity games by showing that lettinen's algorithm when implemented efficiently can be viewed as uh, one of the two meta algorithms on a suitable stralar universal tree thank you for listening to the talk